Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, speak a little bit to uh, this broader topic of drug discovery and cryo EM. But over the last several years, I've been interested in structure guided drug discovery broadly, uh, but in particular using cryo EM. And in our community, we often focus on the front end of the process where we are looking at structures and the way that small molecules bind. But today I'd like to uh, present a, a somewhat different perspective coming from the other end, looking at drug discovery through the lens of FDA approvals. If you look at the numbers, uh, it, they tell an interesting story. If you look at how many drugs were approved by FDA in 2023, it's 71 uh, new drugs that were approved. And that number is a bit higher than what it has been historically. But still, uh, given the scale of the enterprise, uh, worldwide enterprise and drug discovery, you might think that's not a lot. Uh, and if you look at the way that these uh, new approvals are distributed, uh, they typically are uh, in one of these categories, small molecules, antibodies, oligos, peptides and proteins, gene and cell therapies, and vaccines. Uh, but by and large, the majority of them are in the top two categories uh, with small molecules and antibodies making up about 70% of all the new approvals. Uh, we can dig a little bit deeper into this to see exactly how this, uh, uh, how this basically bears out in terms of uh, the uh, number of drug approvals by modality and the indication. And if you look at the overall approvals in the last two years, uh, 22 and 23, uh, there were 22 antibody therapeutics that were approved uh, and 51 small molecule drugs. So small molecules do make up uh, the majority of these approvals. And we can now look at what indications uh, that these uh, molecules are approved for. And if you look on the right-hand side, you see that oncology uh, makes up about a quarter of all of these uh, indications, and it's the majority. The rest are distributed across the board with inflam inflammatory diseases, hematology, infectious diseases, metabolic diseases. We've seen a lot of interest in that space lately, uh, neurology, and a variety of other uh, indicational spaces spanning ophthalmology, dermatology, and women's health. Uh, but certainly, oncology does remain the major area for new drug approvals. Uh, if we drill a little bit deeper into this, uh, we can look at how many small molecule drugs were approved in oncology in the last two years, and there are 13 of them. There were five in 22, a bit more in 2023, but together, about 13. Out of these, there's one of these uh, that's on the extreme right, that's uh, radiotherapy. But the less, rest are largely classical small molecules. These are or, those uh, uh, designed for oral dosing. But it's actually interesting to look at the targets that these drugs are aimed at. And that's shown on this slide, where what, what I'm presenting here is a full set of the targets that these 13 drugs uh, were directed against. And there's some interesting trends here. One of, the, one of them being that eight out of these 13 are kinase inhibitors, and only three are against new targets. And that's a surprisingly small number, but that is pretty, but it's pretty much the way these uh, approvals go. It takes a long time. And uh, the fact that uh, the vast majority are kinase inhibitors, which uh, is familiar territory, tells a story in its own right in terms of where the, where the arrow uh, is pointed in terms of these new drug approvals. So what does all of this mean uh, for drug discovery that is guided by cryo I And mean, here are some thoughts. Uh, first of all, if you look at that chart, it's clear that there's limited diversity in the protein targets for which there are approved drugs. Uh, it's true that oncology remains the indication where the majority of small molecule drugs have been approved in recent years. But most of these new small molecule drug approvals in oncology are for kinases, many of which are tractable by X-ray crystallographic methods. 
But if you look past this, uh, the main point I want to make uh, is that it would appear that the area, the proteins that are not represented in these approvals, which include multi-protein complexes, transient protein complexes, membrane proteins, and allosteric proteins, these are poorly represented in FDA approvals, and these represent target classes where uh, cryo-EM can be a useful tool to drive drug design. In my lab uh, at UBC and at Gandiva Therapeutics, uh, we've been essentially following this principle, and I want to share with you today uh, two examples, one from Gandiva Therapeutics and one from my lab, where uh, we are trying to use cryo-EM to accelerate uh, drug discovery, and more than accelerate, uh, we're looking to use the information from obtained from these cryo-EM structures to, uh, to design molecules that are informed by the structure. The direction that uh, we selected uh, to work on is to look at transient protein interfaces. Uh, and the reason they make ideal drug targets is because pretty much uh, in all cells, protein-protein interactions drive biological function. Uh, some proteins that are key signaling proteins might have up to 100 different proteins that they interact with in the course of normal cell function. And these interactions are dynamic. In many cases, they change. They depend on the signal. And what we are doing is to understand these interactions. And once we, once we zero in on a specific interaction, to design molecular glues that bind at the interface between the target protein of interest and an interacting protein. Uh, the, the way that I use the definition molecular glue here is, uh, is broad. Uh, it's just basically what the word means, which is small molecules that serve as glues at the interface between the, the proteins of interest to us. Uh, they can include dual inhibitor molecular glues that is essentially inhibit both the proteins in the mix. They can be gain of function interfacial glues where these molecules essentially compensate for mutations at the interface, or they can include degrader interfacial glues, which is uh, very which is actually more uh, commonly the the uh, the way in which the the phrase is used, where the inter interface is between a target of interest and the substrate binding domain of an E3 ligase. But irrespective of it, uh, the idea of using glues is what drives uh, the programs uh, that we are working on. And in particular, we have selected to work on the MAP kinase pathway, uh, which is uh, rich in protein-protein interactions, is uh, at the core of uh, signaling in, in our cells. And if you look on the left-hand side, there's a somewhat simplified view of how uh, we might we might have thought about the MAP kinase pathway in terms of a linear set of interactions, EGFR going to RAS, to RAF, to MEC, and to ERK. However, a more realistic view is that it's a very complex network of interactions with lots of feedback loops. And in particular, the central piece of this is uh, a pathway that is triggered by RAS, which involves a number of proteins, uh, many of which form transient complexes that are critical for signaling. So our focus on the MAP kinase pathway uh, is thus to select interactions that are important. And here's one example of an interaction that we have targeted uh, where the problem we are trying to solve is that aberrant cell signaling is driven by mutations and proteins in the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, and what we do know is that nearly half of all the tumors uh, that, we are, that are observed are tied to MAP kinase pathway activation. It's well known that there is drug resistance from virtually all these inhibitors, and the vast majority of them are inhibitors that target single proteins. Uh, the solution that we are pursuing is to design dual inhibitor molecular glues, where we are looking to target two molecules or two proteins simultaneously, uh, with the idea that this results in a lower likelihood of resistance because we are targeting an interface, uh, it also enables us to design inhibitors that are active against upstream mutants and those that are also synergistic with other pathway inhibitors. The uh, 
progression to uh, getting a, a lead molecule for this molecular glue was driven by cryo-EM, which we used uh, consistently through the process of going from a weak, uh, weak hit identified by virtual screening at 10 micromolar all the way to a five nanomolar lead in about nine months. Uh, what's important here is that uh, what you see here is the cumulative number of compounds synthesized is less than 200 over this period. And uh, we pretty much uh, did structures as needed along, along the way. And the fact that we could do these structures uh, and use that to drive medicinal chemistry was critical to converging rapidly to a lead compound. Uh, we went on to we went on to do do a number of other studies, biochemical, biophysical studies, and of course the whole point of designing these molecules is that they have in vivo activity. And here are just some examples of how where we've shown in uh, in, in xenograft models uh, that this molecular glue uh, is a potent glue measured biochemically, but also uh, shows uh, it shows efficacy. In, in these models as a, and has potent anti-tumor activity. In the uh, process of designing all of this, one of the core uh, things that we have seen, not just in the program I've shown you, but in other uh, medicinal chemistry programs, is, is the uh, important finding that in, these, in the progression uh, from lower potency to higher potency, uh, we see a synergy uh, between uh, this, the potency and the resolution that's observed. So the example that I'm showing you here, uh, we are changing the uh, moiety at the end from a hydrogen to an amide to a sulfonamide. And what you see here is that as the uh, molecules get to be more potent, the, they're held more tightly. They pick up interactions in the binding site, and that in turn leads to better resolution in the binding site, and that in turn drives our ability to design or make changes uh, at the right places in the molecule. So uh, there is great power in using this, uh, this type of structure-guided approach uh, as we go through the iterative process. And the fact that uh, we can do this all along the way uh, actually was a very important, has been a very important tool in multiple programs. Uh, I want to share with you a second example. This is uh, work from my lab where uh, we're exploring another dimension of using cryo-EM to uh, drive the design of compounds that influence conformation, uh, particularly quaternary conformation. In this example that I show here with the ryanodine receptor, we're looking at the binding site uh, that, uh, of, of ATP, but we're also looking at the density from progressively truncated versions of ATP. So if you go all the way down to adenine, that's on the uh, in the middle panel at the top, uh, you see that you can see density for it. And as we go, as we look at the densities for progressively larger molecules, they're all essentially roughly in the same same pocket. But we can do more than merely measure the binding of the these compounds. And what we can do is to correlate the size with the conformation, essentially as a scalar measurement. So what you see here is uh, a different way of showing the uh, structure where we're looking at the net changes along the, uh, along the chains, uh, is essentially the deviation of C alpha atoms as a function of what's bound in the binding pocket. So this uh, is just an example of how uh, we, can, we, we can use in the des design process not just the location of the molecule, but simultaneously correlate uh, using numbers, uh, the extent of the change and whether the change is modulated uh, by the addition of specific atoms in, in the ligand that binds it. Now, these examples I've shared with you, uh, especially in, in our field, they often tend to concentrate at the front end of the process where we're focused on generating lead molecules using cryo-EM, much in the way that X-ray crystallography was used uh, in the previous decades. Uh, we're essentially following the same principle where the medicinal chemistry is uh, focused on using the information to get leads. But it's just the beginning of a long process. And uh, uh, as we move into lead optimization, the need for structural information is progressively reduced. 
And other parameters become very important, medicinal chemistry, uh, uh, measuring ADME properties, in vivo toxicology. These are all important parameters as we go forward. And once uh, it gets to the step of selecting a candidate, a number of other parameters come into play, such as the safety and the pharmacology. Uh, the, some of the uh, regulatory aspects come into, come into view. And eventually this, of course, moves it into preclinical development where there's a scale-up process, the safety and pharmacology more intensive. And then there's much more uh, in terms of looking at regulatory processes. And of course, all of that leads up to do essentially running a safety trial uh, in a phase one uh, clinical trial. Uh, of course, this uh, progression from left to right is for cases that survive this process. And there's tremendous attrition in the molecules, uh, uh, the, the, tremendous attrition in the uh, in the number of molecules that actually go through, and only a small small number actually make it all the way through there. And even then, uh, that's just the beginning of the process. Uh, an interesting way to look at uh, the overall uh, landscape is to look at the time scale from discovery to approval. What you see on the x-axis is the length of time from filing of a patent, meaning that there's a novel, a novel composition that's been discovered, and from that time to FDA approval, you see the median time for this is about 12 years. The preclinical development times I showed in the previous slide, they can take somewhere between three to five years. So this is a long drawn process. There's some examples where it can be done a little bit quickly. And very often those are examples of fast followers where there's special cases, but by and large, uh, this is a somewhat slow process. And it's interesting that uh, uh, it's, pretty much the same, whether it's small molecules and antibodies, at least as far as the median goes. Now, this is, uh, on the one hand, uh, a daunting prospect. But on the other hand, I think the presumption, uh, and I think I would say my belief is that by using cryo-EM at the early stages, which are largely now the preclinical stages, uh, we have a better chance to lower the failure rate later in, these, in, the, in the clinical trials, simply because we know more about the binding of the molecule. Uh, we know more about the location of the, of, of the binding, location of the molecule in the binding site. And we also know something about the confirmation. And uh, we know something about the confirmation uh, in, in a state that is closer to physiolog the physiological state. So I think there's several reasons to, to hope that the use of cryo-EM will add a uh, new layer of information that, uh, you know, if it bears out, should lower the failure rate, but we don't know yet. Uh, the last point I want to make is uh, this is a dis crowded field. Drug discovery uh, is very often uh, try attempted by many, many uh, ac across the world. And we saw a good example of that with COVID, uh, therapy, COVID-19 therapeutic discovery programs and uh, what's astonishing is that even as recently as last year, uh, last May, May 23, there were something like 500 plus therapeutic discovery programs that were documented. And all of us know that we can count uh, on, on, a single, on a single hand the number of pro uh, drugs that we know about are common, uh, be they vaccines or inhibitors. So there's not so many that finally make it through, but still it's interesting that uh, in uh, many cases, there are quite a number of uh, trials that are, that are actually underway at about the same time. So all of this uh, leads me to end on a somewhat lighter note. Uh, with cryo-EM in particular, and uh, especially the topic of the conference, uh, we often think about automation and speeding things up and better processing. I thought I wanted to, uh, I thought I would end with the uh, suggestion of greater automation in the earlier stage. And I wonder how long before this becomes a reality. This is a synthetic image that shows a robot from uh, this company figure, suggesting that perhaps a day may come when uh, data collection is automated with robots handling it. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for your attention. and I'm happy to answer any questions.